Hi, it's Mr. Anderson and this is Mathematical and Computational Thinking Level 3 Mathematical Representations. Math underlies everything in science and so as we start to gather data, we start to represent these underlying equations and formulas and we call those graphs. And so I think of a mathematical representation in science as a graph. And so we're going to be looking at a lot of graphs and we're going to be searching for that underlying math and those underlying math will be connected to a phenomena. And so in this video we're going to actually start with the graph and we'll work through the relationships to figure out the data that underlies the phenomena. So we're going to be working from right to left. And when you're looking at a graph the first thing you want to say is before we even get into the graph we want to identify what's the phenomena that this graph is really representing. And then a graph is going to have two components. It's going to have the parts of the graph, and we call those the components, and then it's going to have the relationship between those components. And what we're really looking for, a powerful tool in math, is looking for proportions within those relationships. And those proportions could be something simple like a direct proportion or a linear proportion, it could be a squared proportion, or there might be no proportion at all. And so in this video, when you're done, you should be able to look at mathematical representations of things like the dimensions in a square or in the energy of a powerful wave. I'm going to start by showing you graphs of the ingredients that are found in chocolate chip cookies and then you'll have a chance to do the same with the birthday paradox. So let me clean this up and then we'll get started. Okay, so th for the first graphs that I'm looking through, we've got uh, a relationship between flour and cookies and sugar and cookies. And you can see that our phenomena is a very yummy chocolate chip cookie recipe. And so you can see in here that this is designed to make four dozen cookies and it's got a lot of the different ingredients that we would put inside it. So that's going to be the phenomena that we're digging into. But the next thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at the two graphs. And so we have a graph, we'll call this graph one, where we're looking at the dozen cookies on the x-axis and then grams of flour is going to be on the y-axis. And so as you're starting to do graph analysis, the first thing that you want to identify are what are the components that are found in this graph, or in this case, these two graphs. And so I'm going to write down what I think are all of the components or the parts of these graphs. So the components that I've written down are dozens of cookies. I can see that right here on the bottom or the x-axis. And when you're looking at a graph, you really want to know, can I write on this graph? And the answer should always be yes. And I like to kind of work on a graph from the outside more to the inside. And so the first thing I would always look at is the title. And then I'm going to look at what's labeled on these axes. And so that's where I'm pulling my components from. I've got dozens of cookies right here. I also saw that up here in the title. I've got grams of cookies right here. I also see that in the title and those are going to be two, two components that I'm looking at. As you look at the other one, we're replicating that. So dozens of cookies shows up again. It's going to be found right there. But then we have this new component which is going to be grams of sugar. When you're doing cooking, lots of times you maybe don't want four dozen cookies. Maybe you want three dozen or maybe you want 2.5 dozen cookies. And so I think that's what this graph is really getting at, the relationships between all of those. So first thing I want to do is I want to pull out all of the components. The next thing I want to do is I want to start working backwards and identifying or quantifying what are some of the terms on here. So if I'm looking at this one, a really good way to do that on a graph is always to start with what is the minimum value. That's always a good place to start. And then what is a maximum value? So how, what is the lowest part and then what is the highest part? And then you also want to start looking at like what's the overall, we call this in science, the trend. This, in this case, it looks like a pretty straight line or a linear trend. It's going up. And so after you've done that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to pull out some values. So I'm going from the graph to actual quantities that are found on the graph. And that'll allow me to really dig into the proportions. And let me show you how I would organize that. 
So I'm starting to pull out some of the data from the graph, and so I'm just marking on it. So it's zero and zero down here, but you can kind of see on here at four dozen cookies, it's 240 grams. And so what really makes good graphical analysis is when you can quantify, can actually get numbers. And so now I've got my min and I've got my max. I also want to probably gather a little bit more data. So maybe I could go right here at one dozen, I could go at two dozen. So let me gather some other data points off the graph itself. And that requires, remember, reading where you are on the X and then kind of going across and figuring out what does that look like on the Y. So let me record some of those in here as well. All right, so I'm taking this graph and now going kind of back to a data table. So I'm moving back uh, and looking at now what's the relationship between these two. So I've got the components, I've got a lot of numbers or quantities which are the components, but I really wanna start looking at now what is the relationship between dozens of cookies and grams of flour. And a really powerful tool that you can use to figure this out is what's called a proportion. And so a proportion is a way to figure out how are the numbers in this column related to the numbers in this column. And so a quick way to do that is to say, let's start at the beginning and are they a way to think about this? Are they equal? Like, is this equal that? I would say, no, it doesn't equal that because zero dozen doesn't equal zero grams. The units are gonna be different. And even the number four doesn't equal 240. And so we know that they're not equal, but are they proportional? What does that mean? Well, if I double this, so if I double this from one dozen to two dozen, does this number double as well? It does, so as this goes from one to two, this goes from 60 to 120. Or if I quadruple this from one to four, do I quadruple this? I'd say, yeah, I'm quadrupling it as well. And so there is a, a proportion there. And the symbol that we use in science to show a proportion is just this symbol. And it basically means that these are directly proportion to each other. So I would call that a direct proportion between the dozens of cookies and the grams of flour. And so if you want to make three dozen, for example, that's going to be 180 grams, and I can see how that matches up here. So that would be a direct proportion. Now the next thing I would do is look at a different graph. So I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm gonna look at this different graph where we're looking at um, dozens of cookies and the grams of sugar. So let me do the same thing. I've already got the dozens of cookies, but let me write some of those uh, grams of sugar. Okay, now I can look at the proportion here between the two. And so what's the proportion between dozens of sugar and grams, or dozens of cookies and grams of sugar? Well, as I double this, so as I double this from one to two, does this double from 100 to 200? I would say, yeah. Does this double for, as I quadruple this from one to four? Does this quadruple? I would say, yeah. And so I could say at this point, there's a clear direct proportion between the two. And so I could add that symbol. So there is a proportion between grams of sugar and dozens of cookie. And we could say that is a direct proportion between the two. And you could even do the same. What about grams of flour to grams of sugar? If I double this from 60 to 120, do I double that from 100 to 200? I would also say grams of sugar and grams of flour are directly proportional as well. And so if we go through what I just did, number one, identify what are the important components within the graph. And that required me looking at the axes and the title. And then the next part, when I'm really looking at the relationships, a really powerful tool is that mathematical tool of proportion. And I'm looking for, is it a direct proportion? It also could be a squared proportion, or there could be no proportion at all. And so what I'm gonna do is clean this all up, and then I'm gonna give you a couple of graphs that you could look at as well. Okay, for the next one, we're looking at, uh, it's called the birthday paradox. How many students have to be in a classroom for there to be a 50% chance that two of the students share the same birthday? So if I was in, for example, a class of 30, what are the odds that two of us would share the same birthday? And, and this is really looking at the 50% chance. I could also look on here. I'll include these graphs down below so you can take a look at these. This one is...
probability of shared birthday by number of people in the group. So it's got the number of people at the bottom and then probability of shared birthday is kind of on the y-axis. And so first thing we want to do is we want to define the phenomena. So the phenomena is the birthday paradox. If you don't know what a paradox is, it's, it's a result that you get that doesn't seem the same as, as what you think it might be. That's where the word paradox comes from. And so uh, what I'm gonna do is pause the video. You should do the same, pause the video, take a look at the graph and do what I did. Go through, mark up the graph, identify what are the important components, and then identify the relationships. Are they proportional relationships? Are they direct? Are they squared? Or is there no proportion found in them? And again, a good way to do that is go from the graph back to a data table, just like I did. So again, pause the video and then Come back and we'll see how our thinking compares. Okay, so the first thing I would want to do is, again, mark, mark up the graph, mark up the data. So we're looking for a 50% chance that two share the same birthday. And so this idea of percent sharing the birthday is important. And then this idea that we have two students, uh, so students and the number of students is going to be important because it's asking about how many students have to be in the classroom. And so I think that's an important thing. As I look at the components on here, it says the probability of shared birthday by the number of people in the group. And number of people in the group is on the X and then the probability of shared is going to be on the Y. And so at this point, I think I am pretty clear on what the components are. Let me write those down. And so the probability of shared uh, birthday is gonna be one of the big components on here. That's gonna be on the y-axis. And then the number of people in the group, that's gonna be on the x-axis. The next thing I wanna do is start thinking about what is important evidence that I wanna that I want to look at. So I think like the minimum is always a good place to start. The maximum is a good place to start. Since I'm asked for 50%, I think that would be an important data point as well. And then I could put some, since I've got 0, 50, I could do maybe let's look at what happens at 25 would be another one. And then maybe what happens at 75 might tell me a little bit about what's going on in the graph. So again, marking up those important parts. And then what I'm going to do is kind of work backwards from the graph and figure out what those numbers are. That'll tell me a lot more about the proportions. Let me do that. Okay, so gathering some quantities or some numbers from the graph is really helpful because looking at how the trend changes is important. It seems to increase the slope and then decrease the slope. But getting actual numbers allows me to start looking, remember, at the proportion between the two. What's our general rule is if you double this, does this double? So as I double this from 25 to 50, does this double? No. Uh, if I triple this, does this triple? No, it doesn't. So that's kind of ruling out this direct proportion. It's also probably not a squared proportion. The only part that might be kind of a squared proportion would be kind of this part down at the bottom. And so as I start to look at this, uh, it's an interesting, but there's no straight relationship. So if I were to summarize this a little bit, I would say there's no clear proportion between the two, but it doesn't mean that this is not valuable. I can read the data off here and I can answer the question. I can answer the question that what are the, uh, how many students have to be in a classroom for there to be a 50% chance of them sharing a birthday? I could just read that across. It's going to be 23 people. And so that's weird because you would think if 23 divided by maybe 365 days, the percent would be less. But I think as you start to share, uh, as you tick off different birthdays, then uh, there are less that you choose from each time. And so that's a little complex, but that's not what we're doing again. What we're doing is trying to figure out like how to identify the components and then find the relationships. Now that you've done that, what I would encourage you to do is do some others. I've got some link down below on looking at the dimensions of squares, length, width, and
area, and then you could look at the energy of a wave. Is it related to the frequency of the wave or the amplitude of the wave? And so again, the key thing to do is to start with the graph, identify the major components, and then figure out what the relationships are. And the easiest way to do that is right on the graph and to mark it up. So that is mathematical representations, and I hope that's helpful.